moving into a time where your technical skills are only going to be about 25% of your value you bring. So you've got all of these new skills you need in order to have a bright future. A lot of people call them soft skills. I will tell you they're anything but soft and they're anything but easy. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for this podcast. We are a show that is all about accounting careers, what it takes to start your career, what it takes to progress in your career, and specifically all the different career paths that are available to you with a background or education in accounting. Well, our guest for this week is Joey Havens, executive partner with Horn LLP, a regional accounting firm with a national footprint. It's been a while since we had a good old traditional work your way up story, and so I was really looking forward to recording this show. Joey started with Horn 35 years ago and became executive partner in 2011. Something that you're going to notice very early in the interview is that Joey is a very humble individual. I had to dig in a little to get him to share his own story with us because he definitely had an urge to talk more about, you know, keys for younger up and coming professionals and the future of the profession, which I definitely wanted to get into as well. But I wanted to make sure we covered some of his own story for everybody's benefit. This is a great episode for many of us, of course, but definitely if you are early on in your career and you'd like some insight into what an executive partner's life is like on a daily basis. And of course, if you're looking to grow your own career up to that leadership level, we get deep into the skills that are needed to continue to progress in the workplace today. And Joey didn't just recommend, you know, quote unquote, soft skills. He gets very specific. It's definitely a great discussion. If you do find value in this episode for yourself, please check us out online. You can find us at Where Accountants Go. We have all kinds of audio and written accounting career focused materials for you. Other podcasts, of course, but we have publications, we have books, we have blogs. There's a lot of stuff to check out at whereaccountsgo.com. If you're looking to grow your own career, one specific publication that may interest you is 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career. It was our first book that came out. You can find it on Amazon, of course, but you can also find it for immediate delivery at our website, whereaccountsgo.com. Well, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Joey Havens of Horn LLP. Well, hello, Joey. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I'm excited to be with you today. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to this too. Well, a little background for the audience. We have Joey Havens, executive partner with Horn LLP, on the phone with us today. And he was introduced to me by one of our former guests, Lindsay Stevenson. I was delighted to get the introduction because we haven't had a, you know, quote unquote, large CPA firm professional on the show for a while and certainly not an executive partner. And I like to make sure the show is balanced and really shows all the different paths that you can take with your career in accounting. From our pre-show talk, I know we're going to get a very well-balanced perspective from Joey, both on how to be successful in today's firm, but then also some insights into the future and changes you know, taking place in firms and the profession as we go forward. Joey, before we move into the forward-looking discussion, though, I do always like to start at the beginning so everyone understands how you got started and how you got to where you are today. What initially caused you to think about pursuing accounting as a career in the first place? Mark, I wish I had a wonderful story for you, but how I grew up from the age of five and knew I was going to be an accountant. But (laughs) truthfully, you know, I started in engineering school, but I took some accounting also my first freshman year. And I'd had one course when I was in high school. And for some reason, I just kept drifting back to, I think I like accounting. And so after my freshman year, I actually switched over from the engineering school to the uh, accounting school. And the rest is really history that probably nobody really cares about. (laughs) Okay. We've had a few reformed engineers on the program, so (laughs) it's not quite that unusual. (laughs) So how did you get started in the industry? Was Horn your first position? It was not. I actually was recruited out of school and went to work for Arthur Anderson. I moved from my home state of Mississippi to Houston, Texas, spent almost three years with them before I decided to move back to Mississippi. Okay. 
When did you uh, join Horn? Because I know it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually been at Horn for 35 years, and that sounds like a long time, but it seems like 35 months. I mean, it really does, and it's just time goes so, so fast. Okay. Did you start as a staff accountant? Was that the next position after Anderson? Well, actually, I had, you know, by then I had four years experience, and I had also done some part-time well, not part-time, temporary CFO work for a client of Horn's. And when Horn recruited me, I actually, with four years' experience, went in as a first-year manager with Horn. Okay. Yeah, this is the first time we've had someone on the show that was with an organization for over 30 years. I know we've had some long-term you know, players before, but this is unusual. So it's sort of hard for me to know where to start exactly. I think with you, maybe if we could cover some of the highlights of your career or some of the major milestones where you learned important lessons, what are some of those that come to memory? Well, obviously the lessons, when you mentioned that, I'm, you know, a while ago I said 35 years sounds like uh, 35 months. And when I think about the lessons learned, it's like 35 minutes, except it's 35 minutes underwater. And that's a long, long time. But, you know, the great thing about lessons learned and mistakes is that's how we grow and it's how we reach our full potential. It's one of the reasons why I do conversations like we're having today, Mark, is that I truly believe in trying to help others and share some of the mistakes I made so that they can develop faster. That's probably my biggest takeaway over 35 years is that you're never ready for the next step. You just have to take it. And uh, that when you develop others around you, it comes back to you 10 times over. I started my career with Arthur Anderson in Houston, Texas, as we said. And, you know, what I would tell you is I was very naive. I had no idea what the big eight was. I did not know about big business. It was just a world that I did not grow up in and I was not familiar with. But I, I waited in there and I kept raising my hand and I learned and learned quickly. And even though when I started, I didn't have a great concept of what the accounting profession was, what I can tell you today is the students we're recruiting today, the students that I interact with are so much more prepared to understand those dynamics and they have so much more information at their fingertips to understand the profession and what's going on. So I started there, but after three years, wanted to move back to Mississippi and joined Horn in 1984. I know that sounds like ancient history to many of you, but it makes me uncomfortable to think about it too. Milestones during that time, I've certainly had a lot along with the lessons that I've learned. And let me say this, it always makes me uneasy to talk about myself. I'm an introvert, (laughs) but that's actually another lesson I learned in my career is that I could let that hold me back. Or I could use that to my strength and be intentional about pushing myself out of my comfort zone. And really, that's a challenge for a lot of us. And it's one of them that I learned. And one of the reasons I was able to have a quick career track is I realized that I hadn't pushed past that. So just eight years out of college, I made partner with Horn in 1988 four years with the firm, eight years out of college, and was certainly the youngest partner at Horn, the youngest partner for a long time. But that was truly a milestone and a celebration for me, but it was really the point I really started learning. You know, one of the things that I learned is that I was going to be a very different partner than the partners that I was working with and partners that I had around me and the ones that had been on a traditional track. That's the thing that I share with our professionals today is, you know, you're going to be a partner in a much different manner than I was. But I focused on a niche. I gained ground quicker and became noted for playing hard and working hard. So because of that flexibility and the ability to integrate my life and my career, I fell in love with public accounting, even though that's not the narrative. And it certainly hadn't been always the experience of people in our profession. When I focused on results, I found that I had a lot of opportunity to integrate my life and it was uh, very abundant. That was something that I valued a lot. And what it requires is you have to own it. You have to own the results. You have to own your career client commitments. But when you do that, it just paves the way for a lot of freedom and fun. So early on, the firm asked me to work with medical practices. Healthcare was our big niche, only niche back then. We did mostly general practice for everybody. And that's where I learned the power of focus. I share with students today and with our team, if you read 15 minutes a day on a subject, in three years you'll be an expert. 
and that's literally what I did on medical practice operations, which led to me being named firm-wide director of physician services, a position we didn't even have until we grew such a strong client base with that, and the client base actually became a national footprint. In 1991, firm moved me to Hattiesburg to run a local office, and at that time I was elected to the board. So now I'm sitting here at 33 years of age and a board member, and a firm that's on a great uh, growth path. So that was quite an honor. But it was in my early years in Hattiesburg where I had to really start building a team that I hit the wall, really understand it wasn't about me, but it's about raising people around me. And that's when I really got my first coach. When I say coach, I'm talking about a performance coach that's outside of the norm, not your performance advisor or mentor. This was somebody that's actually outside our firm that I used as my performance advisor to help me see myself, to ask myself hard questions. And I've come to know now that no one really reaches their full potential without coaching and sponsorship. And I certainly was fortunate enough to have sponsors all during my career. And it's one of the things that I work really hard to make sure our firm has sponsors for everybody because we all need it. A few years later, I was promoted to director of healthcare, which was the largest niche in the firm. And I ran that until 2007. And that's when I took one of the biggest risks I've ever taken in my career. Our firm had suffered from Katrina. We had lost several offices. We'd had several team members displaced, Hurricane Katrina. Mm. But we had gained a big contract in helping with the state of Mississippi in the recovery on Katrina recovery. And in 2007, one year into that contract, the board said we really need to turn this into a business model. And they came to me. And so after 18 years in healthcare, all I knew was healthcare. I switched over to lead a team where I had no knowledge of the work of the client. We only had one contract and we had no real prospect for where the next one would come from. But I took what I learned from growing teams in the healthcare role over to my new role. And today we call this niche government services. It's now the largest focus area in the firm. And it's where we focus on disaster recovery work, both on the FEMA funds and the HUD funds that come into state agencies. And I ran uh, government services until 2013. I was elected to the executive partner role of managing partner at Horn in 2011. So I wore two hats for a couple of years. I mean, that was a tremendous milestone, certainly an incredible accomplishment, but it was really a result of having great team and great team members. And I will tell you that it was a very, very scary time because it probably shook me as much as anything about Am I really ready to serve 350 people? And I just share as go through those milestones. That's one of the things that I've learned about leadership. As you move up, it becomes less and less and less about you and more and more about the people you serve. So that's a quick synopsis, Mark, of uh, <laughs> I guess what those milestones would be. And just for those that aren't familiar with Horn, can you give us a little snapshot of who Horn is? Yeah, sure. Horn is a regional firm. We have a national footprint in some of our focus areas. We have eight primary focus areas. I think that's one of the things that's distinctive and unique about Horn. We have mostly a southeastern footprint, but we have project offices and work all across the country, and uh, we're doing some work in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and some other places. We're mostly a southeastern footprint. Besides being distinctive in that we put it out there on our website, We don't hide from the fact that we made the decision eight years ago that we wouldn't be everything for everybody, that we would have focus areas where we felt good about being relevant and bringing real value, creating value and making a difference, which is our mission and the way we're able to do that by not being everything to everybody. And probably the other unique thing about Horn is the one you hear about every firm. You ask somebody, you know, what makes your firm unique? The first thing out of their mouth is culture. It's a little harder to get people to understand that, but I think if you look under the hood at Horn a little bit and see that we've named ours the Wise Firm, that's what we call our culture. It's the core strength of the firm, and it's how we do life together. And it's built on the foundation of we in service, 
And we actually derived that from uh, the biblical parable about the wise man and the foolish man. And you might know that parable, but the wise man built his house on the rock, and the foolish man built his house on the sand, and the rains came, and the wind blew, blew the foolish man's house away. And so when we talked about making culture number one, that's the foundation we wanted to build our firm on. We feel like that it's already proven to help us, you know, withstand the storms, and there's a lot of them today. There's exponential change. There's, you know, new competition that we've never seen before. There's talent war. There's all kind of things going on. And just like you can see on our website and on social media and you can view the wise firm way, we just focus on having a sense of belonging for everybody. And I just think that is unique, not only in our profession, but in our world today. Well, you've given me a lot to think about here. I was just looking at some of my notes. Something you said really caught my attention. You said, I'm an introvert, don't like talking about myself. And I think that many of us accountants can relate to that. I have no hard statistics, but I'm willing to bet it's over 50% that would relate to the term introvert. Whether you think about what you did or whether you think about what people can do now, if I'm an accounting student or I'm the first couple of years in my career, I mean, what practical steps can I take to combat that? <laughs> yeah, and it's less about combating and more about using it as a strength and recognize that there's a lot of strengths to that. One is, you know, you're going to process things and not speak out of turn as often as some extroverts might. And sometimes that's extremely valuable. And you're going to look for strong connections, not light connections. So there's a lot of strengths to it. But the way that you really push your comfort zone is a word that we don't like to hear about and we don't like to talk about, and that's practice. It's truly one conversation at a time. It's one presentation at a time. It's one podcast at a time. You continue to practice and push yourself, and you get better and better at it. Now, on the flip side of that, what I had to learn about myself, and I think it's true for a lot of introverts, I learned I had to then, if I do something big, if I do a presentation and there's a 500 people out there and, you know, I do 90 minutes and I take questions and answers, I already know I've got to have a couple of hours of quiet time to renew my energy. So part of learning that is practicing and then making sure you restore your energy and then go again. That's interesting. I've heard that same advice and I can relate to that personally. For instance, today, recording this podcast, it's no problem. I've done it many times. But when I get home later, I'll be quiet for a while. (laughs) I do do a lot of listening, not much talking, for sure. Well, you're doing the same thing. I'm going to be looking for some quiet time, too, and I'm already realizing I've got company coming tonight for a fish fry. So I'll have to grab me at least 30 minutes before I get to the house. Yeah, another item you made me think about, I'm not sure that people just getting into the profession or definitely students really have a real picture of what the job of an executive partner is like. I mean, I think that they understand its management and they understand their financial rewards the further you get into your career. But outside of that, I'm not sure people really have a perspective, which is frankly, I think, a problem in the profession. Tell us a little bit about what a typical day or week or month is like at this level. How do you spend your time? I'm pretty sure you're not sitting there doing audits or you know, ticking and tying or tax returns. So that's why I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. I think what I love about a day in my life, if you want to call it that, is that it's always different. That's what's very exciting to me is fast paced, it's impactful. I think at least the way Horn is defined my role, my role is to focus on strategy, partner support, and leadership development. So I try to always put my calendar, my priorities in those three buckets, strategy, partner support, leadership development. Now, there's certainly a lot of other things that happen, but when I know when the day is over, if I haven't worked on one or all three of those buckets, then I'm not delivering the value I need to deliver to my team. So my day is very varied. It, you know, today is was actually uh, one that I treasure because I had a half a day of work time from home, away from everybody, focused on some client visits I'd made, writing those up, communicating to our partner group some of the opportunities that I think from a strategic standpoint are there. 
I just got to do some real thinking time. And then this afternoon has been all about seeing team members that I need to see, let them know I appreciated what was going on doing this podcast. I've got a performance review to do with uh, one of our leaders after the podcast. Then I'm going to grab my 30 minutes I told you about a while ago, and then I'm going to go host at my house. You know, another thing that you have to do in this role is communicate to the firm on a regular basis. And I do that through social media posts, blogs, videos. We have an intranet social media also that we call The Journey. I do web conferences, team meetings. Every week, I try to spend some time with team members understanding what's going on in their lives, show them appreciation, see if they have some ideas how I can serve the team better. From a personal habit standpoint, I start every day. I get up early and have quiet time, gratitude time, reflection. I usually try to spend at least 30 minutes on strategy and reading. And then it's to the office a lot of days or to uh, see see different people wherever, getting out to some of our offices and connecting with people. And I think that's really important to serve people. You've got to connect with them. Hmm. Well, thank you. That's a good overview. One of the items you mentioned to me in our pre-show conversation was that, you know, CFA firms are a lot more complex now than they were when you got started. I'm curious there again, from the perspective of the up and coming professional, what skills do you feel like it's important for them to develop now in order to be successful, maybe versus what you had to do <laughs> in the early years? Yeah, I mean, I think, boy, that's right at the heart of what's going on and the changes surviving. You know, for a 100 years, the profession has just completely rewarded technical, technical, technical competence. And you could get away with a lot of weaknesses if you were just uh, really technically competent. And we're really moving into a time where your technical skills are only going to be about 25% of your value you bring. So... You've got all of these new skills you need in order to have a bright future. A lot of people call them soft skills. I will tell you they're anything but soft and they're anything but easy. They are very impactful and critical. Some of them have a slight technical nature to them, but most of them are soft skills. I'll start with collaboration. Team members have got to be able to work and collaborate across different lines, disciplines, teams, collaboration skills with the clients and being able to work through because we're in a world that's changing very fast and so we're not looking backwards anymore which you know brings me to the next skill which is anticipatory skills it's not sufficient to just be reacting anymore i mean it's great to be agile but even if you're agile you're reacting and developing anticipatory skills which is actually something that we train all of our team members on It's all about understanding what hard trends are, you know, things that are going to happen whether we like them or not. In other words, do you think your phone's going to go backwards to 3G to 2G or is it going to go up to 5G to 8G? (laughs) We know that technology is going to continue to advance. And there's some hard trends out there and soft trends that are likely to happen. And just understanding how to anticipate future opportunities and challenges puts you way ahead of the game. Leadership skills, because you're going to be on a fast track, there's going to be a shorter track. You're going to do things a lot sooner in your career. You Being able to first lead yourself, you can't lead anybody until you can lead yourself. So leadership skills, teaching yourself discipline around that. Being tech savvy is a big skill. Understanding systems, internal controls, cybersecurity. I will tell you that cybersecurity is one of the new frontiers for our profession. We'll be doing more and more assurance work and all kind of project management and things like that around cybersecurity. And then the word you hear over and over again, data analytics. I would encourage anybody in school to make sure that they are taking courses in systems and data analytics. The other two that come to mind, Mark, critical thinking and problem solving, and that is a skill and you can learn how to be better at that. You can practice that. We actually have courses in our career track where we teach people how to be a critical thinker and how to be a problem solver. And then the one that has been there forever that really separated people for the last hundred years is going to separate people for the next hundred, and that's communication skills and being able to communicate over a number of different platforms. 
but communication skills. And this gets back to, again, being an introvert, we will shy away from that conversation if we have the opportunity to do so. And the way we build those communications is by having that conversation that we really would like to avoid. Mm. It's like what you said earlier. It all comes down to practice. Practice, (laughs) practice, practice. Yeah, it's it's interesting how a lot of those items still come down to being involved outside of of simply your classes when you're in school is being involved in, you know, whether it's an accounting club or some other kind of business club or outside, you know, it could be in your church, could be any kind of civic, you know, society, but just doing something other than learning the technical skills. And a job. It's amazing. I don't care whether it's waiting tables, sacking groceries or whatever, you will be amazed at the difference in the maturity level and the communication skills of people that have at least been in the job market to some level. Mm, That's a good point. Actually, that brings me to something else. I believe you mentioned that you were either very active with the internship program there at Horn or you were, of course, involved in how it's formulated. Tell us about the internship program. When you mentioned work, it caused me to think about that. I'm involved. I meet with the interns when we bring them in and we do our fast start, our onboarding process. I always meet with them the first morning and we'll have a lunch together and it's a Ask Joey Anything kind of lunch and we do a leadership summit every year for up and coming juniors and seniors and I'll maybe talk about that in a little bit. But when I think about internship, the question I get the most and it's not exactly the way you ask it, but, you know, I have a passion about this, and I get this question all the time is, you know, how do I have a successful internship? How do I stand out? Mm -hmm. And so the first thing about standing out is not being invisible. So think about this. We just brought 25 interns in and onboarded them. Every intern in the room is plenty smarter. They wouldn't have been invited to be in the room. They're at the top of their class. They'll have lots of job options. They'll be recruited by the big four. They'll be recruited by national firms and by us. So they've already demonstrated the academic achievement. And most of the people that are listening to your podcast are going to be in that class. They or they wouldn't probably wouldn't even be listening. So when you think about being an intern, and really having a successful internship, it's about not being average. And it's pretty easy to do to stick out. The first thing is every day I'm going to bring energy to work. I'm going to be excited about the new day. I'm going to be excited about the new people I'm going to meet. I'm going to be excited about the new challenge. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to ask questions. People love questions. It shows intelligence when you ask questions. It shows courage when you ask questions. I'm going to take time to connect to people. That's going to be hard. If I'm an introvert, I I don't want to share some of that personal things, but it's personal things that help me connect. I think one of the hardest things to do for an intern is to ask for and receive feedback. Feedback is what accelerates people. It's what helps people reach their full potential. I'm going to raise my hand to volunteer. I think interns that really stick out and have great internships, they volunteer and they come as their self. They don't try to be somebody else. I always encourage interns not to be scared about making mistakes. Just own it if you make a mistake and realize that you're not going to, you're not going to be in the room with anybody that hasn't made a mistake. We all make them. So that's the advice that I would give somebody thinking about how do I have a successful internship? How do I not be invisible. At Horn, were you asking me about our programs? <laughs> you gave me an even better answer than I was okay. going for. Thank you. That's a wonderful list. But I am curious about your programs. Yes. Yeah. How do you all do the selection? Or Yeah, we do two types of intern programs. And I mentioned we had just onboarded about 25 interns. We do one short internship, a three-week internship in the summer, where we give the intern group a project to work with our team members. I know this summer it's a project on data analytics, and then we do the 8- to 12-week internships in the spring. We do a few in the summer and do some in the fall. Most of those are in spring. Our key to ours, our objective is for them to really get to know Horn, 
to onboard them like we do regular team members that give them some quick education on the tools they're going to use. We give them buddies so that, you know, they're engaged and included in a lot of things. And we put them in a focus area and they work right directly within a team because we want them to have just as much of real life experience of client work and teamwork that we can give them. And, you know, that's really the short synopsis of what we're doing on the intern program. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have three questions I end every podcast with, and those take some time to get through, and I promise to be respectful of your time. So I am curious, is there anything else that you feel it's important we cover that I haven't asked about? Anything else you'd like to make sure the listeners know about you know, career success or HORN in particular, or any other thoughts in those areas? I think it'd be probably more appropriate to talk less about HORN and talk more about how the profession is changing. Okay, let's talk about that. I mean, I think that is just a big, big deal, and it's affecting all the firms. It's affecting our clients, and this goes really for any business. I want to speak from the perspective of the CPA profession. It's certainly, as we went through that skill set while ago, you would gather that it's a much more of a people business than ever before. It's always been more of a people business than people gave it credit for, but it is going to a whole nother level to where every team member has got to have good people skills. I think the flexibility and integration of your career and life are much better, certainly much better than when I started doing that 30 years ago, and a lot of firms are getting that right. But the big changes is that CPA firms are truly moving from being about data input and being the historians and moving up that value chain to interpreting data, interpreting trends, providing insights, being anticipatory, and being project managers. It's really a completely different role. And I would say that You know, the big four have always been a little bit like this. There are a lot of disciplines within the big four, but all CPA firms, other than your really, really small ones, are evolving into, I call them CPA-led organizations because what they're doing is they're evolving into organizations where they can address more of a client's full ecosystem. They're recruiting different disciplines, some of the Information I saw out of the AICPA is, you know, 30% of the acquisitions last year were not acquisitions of other CPA firms. They were acquisitions of other types of businesses like human resource businesses and data analytical companies and technology companies. And so we're becoming CPA-led organizations that have a lot of disciplines, very multidisciplinary and a strong recruitment of non-accounting professionals. So it's going to be much more of a mixture, which is back to collaboration, back to making sure with your accounting knowledge that you get system knowledge, you get cyber knowledge, you get data analytical knowledge. So our entire profession is evolving to where compliance is less and less the revenue generator. And we're becoming more and more of an advisory, anticipatory type profession. Hmm. That is a good point. Thank you. Well, I do end every podcast with the same three questions. And a couple of those take a little time. So we probably better move to those. The first one is always from a career perspective. What's been your proudest moment? You know, the thing that naturally comes to mind is when the partner group in 2011 voted unanimously For me to serve as the next executive partner, it was a huge moment. It was a proud moment, and yet it was an extremely humbling moment. It's hard not for that to come to my mind when you ask that question. I admit that that comes to mind, and I remember how humbling that was to me. But I will tell you that one of the things that's nearest and dearest to me, one of the things that probably... I'm proudest of is the personal letters and notes that I get from students and interns and team members on the impact I've had on their lives and their families. I think when I drill down to that and you get past titles and all of those things, those truly are the most rewarding and proudest moments. And I realize, you know, over these 30 years, you know, I've kept all of them. Wow. That is special. You know you're making an impact when somebody, as little as it may seem, but they take the time to tell you in that way. Thank you. 
Well, second question then. Tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it, of course, because that's what we're really after. But the bigger mistake that you're willing to share, the better. (laughs) You know, well, I warmed up when I started with talking about my milestones. I tried to share some mistakes I made along the way that are lessons I learned. And I think I mentioned that when you talk about this, this is like 35 minutes underwater, which is a long, long time. I think the biggest one would sadly be one that I repeated a lot early in my career. And I didn't realize what a big mistake it was. Early on, I was pretty competitive. Not that I'm not competitive today. I think that you can be in competitive as a strength, but you can make it a negative if you take it too far. And I wanted to be known for accomplishments. And with that competitive nature and running for those accomplishments, I left a big wake behind me. I was too focused on me and my achievements, and I didn't help you know, bring those around me along also. So you can do that for a little while in your career, and I certainly was able to do that for a little while, but I hit the wall. I think I hit the wall in Hattiesburg. I mentioned I moved to Hattiesburg to run a local office and continue to grow the healthcare team. And it was when I hit the wall, that's when I reached out and got a coach. And that's when Dr. Joe Paul was my coach, and he helped me realize that the problem I had was not with the team. The problem was with me, and the problem was that I was not focused enough on the team, not focused enough on growing them. And through him and through a lot of hard lessons, I learned that you can always do more together and that when I focus on growing others, it always comes back to me in bucket loads. And I know that's uh, not an isolated story, but sadly, it's one I repeated too much early in my career. And I really didn't start to impact lives and make a real difference and really have truly have success until I figured that mistake out. And it's one that's hard to see because we're blind. Sometimes we don't have good self-awareness, or at least I was. You know, having a coach or a mentor, that is so important. And I'm sure at that point in your life, it may have been hard to admit that you could benefit from it, but you took the step anyway. That's to be applauded. Definitely. We <laughs> we all have growing to do, right? Right. I mean, it was definitely hard. I had hit a wall and I wasn't getting results. And, you know, people really didn't care about whether they worked on my team or not. And it was hard. And I'd always had mentors. That's the thing about it. In the profession, you're going to have mentors. Now, some are going to be good coaches, too. But most of them are going to be all about the task and the project and your goals and your performance. It's A coach really helps you hold a mirror up and look in it and understand what others are seeing and how to manage around some of the obstacles and grab some of the opportunities. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's very open of you. I really appreciate it. Well, last question, and then we'll go ahead and start to close it down. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? That was pretty easy for me. It certainly came from my dad, and he was steadfast in this and that we should seek God's will first. It's the only true path to contentment, and everything else will work out just fine. I got to admit, as a young man, I had a hard time understanding how valuable that advice was. But once I got focused on it, I found that it brought a real joy to everything I do. So I'm so grateful for the opportunities that the accounting profession has given me to impact others' lives. And quite frankly, it's provided me the opportunity to move beyond being successful to really having a career of significance. And I define significance when you impact other people's lives and help them have a better career and a better life. Well, that's really good insight. Thank you very much. Well, for our audience, our guest today has been Joey Havens from Horn LLP, and this has been Life in Accounting. We are a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. If you haven't yet visited the website, please do so. We're going to have the show notes on Joey's episode. We have the show notes on Lindsay's episode as well, all our previous episodes, and we have a lot of career-related content for accountants. Once again, that website is whereaccountantsgo.com. Dot com. On that note, Joey, are there any final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to leave the audience with? I think I would close with one of the things I teach in leadership class, which is the ABCs to outstanding, which is all about managing yourself. A is attitude. Control your attitude. B is better focus. Eliminate those distractions and manage yourself. And C is constant learning. We're on an exponential curve of change. you got to read every day. ABC. Easy to do, easy not to do. 
<laughs> Beautiful. I love it. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.